So good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Raj Chowdhury. I am the chair of Sheffield Humanists, and I'm delighted tonight to have been asked to chair this evening's Young Humanists event. Modern mystics are, are spiritual practices replacing religion. A little bit about Young Humanists. Um, Young Humanists is the 18 to 35 section of Humanists UK. Around two thirds of Britons between the ages of 18 and 35 are non-religious, according to various surveys, or certainly the ones that have been uh, best done. Uh, most share humanist values, even if that's not a term they use or a term they perhaps never come across. Young Humanists has three key aims. Uh, firstly, to attract new young humanists, as the 18 to 35 group is underrepresented as a part of Humanist UK's membership. Uh, secondly, to inform and engage young people about humanism and the work of Humanists UK. And thirdly, to make sure young people are active in the work of Humanists UK and that young voices are heard in that work. Today, we have three panellists, and I'm going to introduce each of them in turn. So firstly, we have Richie Thompson. Richie is the Director of Public Affairs and Policy at Humanists UK. He has worked for Humanists UK for the last decade, having worked on issues across Humanists UK's public policy remit, and is now responsible for the strategic, the strategic direction of that work. During his time at Humanists UK, he's proven himself as a formidable campaigner, achieving widespread media coverage and policy change. Our second panellist is Andrew Dart. Andrew has a master's degree in research psychology and spent four years studying how pre-existing religi uh, religious and paranormal beliefs literally affect the way we see the world around us. He is the author of A Beginner's Guide to Scepticism, uh, an author of a science book for children, and is currently working on a novel. He works as a support technician for a software company where he spends as much time of his day combating bad logic as he does technical issues. When not doing this, he can often be found wandering the byways of Cambridgeshire, reading books, watching philosophy videos on YouTube, and writing pointless computer programs. Our third panellist is Deborah Hyde. Deborah wants to know why people believe in weird stuff. She attributes her fascination with the supernatural to having spent her childhood with mad aunties. She approaches the subject using the perspectives of psychology and history. During the day, she's a film and television industry coordinator and production manager who works in makeup effects and scenery. She also gets on the wrong side of the camera from time to time, as in Terry Gilliam's brother's grip. Deborah was the editor of magazine The Skeptic until she handed over the reins to Merseyside Skeptics in 2020. She was also the co-convenier of Westminster Skeptic, co-convenier, co-convenier of Westminster Skeptics and speaker liaison of Soho Skeptics. In February 2018, she was honoured to be elected a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. And Deborah wants us to know that she does have one sane party. As ever with um, video conferencing events, uh, there are a few grand, you, grand rules. Um, firstly, please keep yourself on mute when you are not speaking, as otherwise the background noise can interrupt other people speaking. Uh, we will take your questions from the chat. If you would like to ask your question out on camera, please indicate this, that you'd like to speak, you know, ask it yourself. Otherwise, um, I will read out your question for you. And finally, please be polite and courteous. Um, I imagine this will not be an issue. It rarely is at Humanist UK events, but we do have the power to kick you out if things go wrong uh, and please don't try and get in arguments with anybody or anything like that we just want to keep the questions relatively short and brief and I'm ask, uh, uh, allow our audience to hear as much as they can um, from our panelists we're going to ask the speakers to make a brief set of opening remarks which will take us to somewhere between quarter two to um, eight o'clock and after this there's going to be around 20 to 30 minutes of panel discussion and then around 20 to 30 minutes for q a so what we will do is we will move on to um, our speakers' opening remarks. These are going to be relatively brief. And essentially what we've asked our speakers to do, uh, asked our panelists to do, is just talk very briefly about what they think uh, are important issues around the sort of rise that we have seen in mysticism. So first of all, I am going to go to uh, Richie Thompson, the Director of Public Affairs and Policy at Humanist UK. Richie, if I could ask you to, um, uh, for your opening remarks, please. Thank you. Um, I've just got some slides that I'm just going to start sharing. Can you all see that? 
Yes, great. Can see that. Okay. Um, so the first thing I have to say is that um, although I may just about be a young humanist, um, I'm not young enough to be a TikTok user. So uh, I know this event description talked about the phenomenon known as witch talk, which I have duly looked up, but that this has entirely passed me by <laughs> before uh, tonight's event. Um, so um, to some extent, I might be uh, coming into this uh, slightly uh, cold, um, but nonetheless, um, I hope uh, I, you'll think I have some interesting things to say. Um, so overall, um, as Raj already said, the majority of um, people in Britain uh, say they belong to no religion when they're asked in the British Social Attitude Survey, for example, here. Um, and actually, um, if you look at that over time, um, the uh, share of the population that belongs to no religion um, has been going up consistently. You can see that the Church of England share of the population has been going down quite a lot. Um, and what you can also see um, is that actually uh, younger people, um, the young humanist demographic is much more likely to uh, say that they belong to no religion than older people. And you can see um, that this is where Raj's two thirds statistic comes from, um, that the 2019 British Social Attitude Survey finds about two thirds of young people say they belong um, to no religion. Um, now, that's a slightly different question from whether or not um, they hold spiritual uh, or mystical beliefs. Um, and um, having looked up some Google Trends, you can see that um, the uh, number of searches for crystal healing has slightly been going up over time, over recent years. Um, I looked up some other Google Trends for some other things, and um, I think that there's, you know, the evidence is less clear. So the, um, I think all these lines are pretty much flatlining, maybe the red line, which is wicker is going down a bit. Um, and similarly, uh, when it comes to um, uh, some uh, various alternative medicines that may sometimes involve spiritual uh, beliefs. Um, um, but um, in terms of spirituality itself, um, again, looking at the British Social Attitude Survey. Um, so here we've got religious, spiritual, both and neither as the four bars. So the, to be clear, the religious and spiritual lines do include people who uh, are uh, both as well. Um, so if you add up all the lines, you'll get to more than 100%. Uh, but what you can see is that the spiritual, the number of people between 2008 and 2018 who said that they're spiritual uh, did go down slightly, um, as did the number of religious and the number who said they were neither went up slightly. Um, although the trend does look like it's slightly slower um, based on uh, uh, these two sample points than the graph I showed you earlier about uh, religion per se. Um, now, what's I think slightly more interesting is if you look at spirituality by age for the 2018 uh, cohort, uh, what you find is, um, well, first of all, as we saw earlier, um, older people are much more likely to say they are religious um, than younger people. So um, it's over 50% for older people, whereas it's closer to 30% for younger people. Um, the first interesting thing here, um, I didn't really expect this, is that younger people uh, are more likely to say they're spiritual than older people. Um, so it does look like some of the people who've been saying um, that they're, uh, no, who are no longer saying they're religious, have moved to a spiritual camp, um, at least according to, you know, this question, you know, do you regard yourself as religious or spiritual? Very simple measure. Um, not something I um, entirely expected, as I said, um, and um, uh, I, I, it may be some, it may be that this is a stepping stone um, towards um, ultimately people saying they're neither. Um, if you look at the line for uh, neither, uh, then it does look like uh, for older people, um, for younger people, they're very much slightly more likely to say they are neither than older people. Um, so um, although the younger cohort is more likely to say they're spiritual, they're less likely to, uh, they're more, also more likely to say they're neither spiritual nor religious, um, if that makes sense. Um, now, um, as uh, Raj said, I work in uh, public affairs uh, for Humanist UK, which is obviously um, uh, uh, an organisation that works on matters to do with religion or belief um, and campaigns around religion or belief. Um, and um, uh, when I see um, debates around um, uh, what the uh, what the what are sometimes called nuns, as in in this article on the left, um, uh, uh, believe or don't believe, often what you see is you see Christians um, claiming that those who belong to no religion are in fact in some sense still religious. Um, so um, here's Christian today, you know, saying that on other measures the 
nuns uh, in America are um, still religious. And on the right, we've got an article uh, by uh, Nick Spencer from Theos, um, which on the next slide I go into a bit more. Um, and um, you can see um, that what he claims in that article is that actually um, various uh, people who say that they are uh, they belong to no religion, nonetheless, believe in things like angels or a human soul um, or heaven and hell or supernatural powers um, and, um, uh, you know, things like karma as well. And so um, in, in, in some senses, perhaps they're not entirely um, nuns. Um, now, um, two can play at that game because uh, when we uh, were campaigning around the census earlier this year, um, we asked people who ticked um, Christian on the census, um, uh, uh, well, people who responded to a question like the census question that they would take Christian, um, what they, uh, you know, about their beliefs in more detail. And we found that um, most of them didn't take um, the um, Christian option uh, because they either uh, believed in the teachings of Christianity um, or because um, of uh, religious observance. Um, but instead they tended to think do that because of their upbringing or um, because when they went to school or because what they think about um, uh, their country, uh, the, the, you know, the country as a whole. Um, and um, lots of those people don't attend a place of worship um, or um, they, um, they equally, so quite a lot of them say they're not particularly religious, you know, a quarter of them said they're, in fact, that they are very or somewhat non-religious. Um, so what does this get, if we come back to where we start, um, where we started, is a belief in crystals just aesthetic or is it an indication of something more? Um, I think none of this kind of particularly shows uh, one way or um, the other. Um, I, perhaps there's a slight trend going on here. Um, I think, as I said, young people do appear to be more likely to be say they're spiritual, but then equally they're more likely to say they're um, neither spiritual nor religious. Um, and um, ultimately, what I think is important is um, basically what people think about policy. Um, and um, when um, those uh, Christians I referred to earlier uh, are making the argument that actually um, the non-religious are in some sense still religious. The reason they're doing that is because they're trying to argue um, that in some sense religion um, is still important and therefore the various policy um, aims that they might have are ones that um, the um, state should, you know, the, the parliament, the government should nonetheless um, choose to follow. Um, but actually, um, if you look at what people think about, you know, um, almost any issue actually that we campaign on at Humanist UK, you find uh, pretty strong, sometimes overwhelming public support. So, for example, um, we asked parents um, what they think about um, appropriate or inappropriate topics for school assemblies. And we found that um, after asking about 13 such topics, acts of religious worship was deemed to be um, the least appropriate topic with most people, most parents saying it would not be appropriate um, and uh, only uh, just over a quarter saying um, that it would less than any of the other topics we asked about. And um, so um, that I think um, is the thing that in my view, is uh, something that uh, is a message that needs to not get lost um, in conversation in such conversations. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you. I hope that was helpful to set the scene. Um, and now back to Raj. Thank you very much, Richie. That was really, um, really interesting. So uh, just a reminder that you can put questions in the chat. Uh, we already have one, which I'll, I'll pass on to Richie about the link. Um, but uh, please do ask your questions in the chat and we will come and see them. So I'd now like to move to Andrew Dart. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that was really interesting, Richard. I, I had a quick look at some of those polls myself, and uh, I think you've really done a great job of, of drawing out the useful information from them. Um, when I was sort of first contacted about this, um, the first thought that went through my head was, do I actually know what it means to be mystical and spiritual? And I did a lot of research on that, and I think the general answer to that question is it's a really nebulous term. There's no really well-defined way of describing either thing um, and I think it all sort of goes back to if we look at sort of some of the early ideas about the psychology of religion with um, people like uh, William James uh, he sort of defined religion and uh, into two groups you had sort of the 
uh, institutionalized religions, which are the ones we're more familiar with, like Christianity, Islam, that sort of things. And then you have the personalized religions, which is what we're really talking about this evening. It's, it's mysticism and spirituality are ways of addressing the same sort of questions as religion, but in a, in a more personal way. It's not about following doctrine. It's not about following holy books. Um, it's about, you know, finding your own paths to truth. Uh, in uh, as uh, they are described sort of uh, these ideas of you know if you want to get touch of, in touch with the divine you do it directly you you ask the questions of the divine and it gives you answers um and so to me what immediately comes to mind is um the skeptical side of this is this a good way of actually finding truth you know if you have two people who are both seeking some kind of revelation about God and they both engage in mystical approaches to doing so and get different answers. Is, is this demonstrating that it's an ineffective way or is it showing us that maybe there's more than one being out there answering? You know, what, what does uh, mysticism actually tell us about the world? And um, like what you said, the, the policy questions, the way people actually address things that we all agree are actually real are important you know if you're um taking an approach to questions where basically you can say i can find deep truths about the universe just by sitting down and thinking about it is that a good way to do so i mean the, uh, one of the things that pops into my head is that i spend a lot of time um online talking to um flat earthers now i'm not saying they're exactly the same th thing as people who believe in mysticism and stuff like that but they have a very similar approach it's very much personal experience tells me about the world i don't need to look outside of that i don't need to do any proper uh, in-depth study or sort of uh, tests and experiments i can take my personal experience of the world in this case it looks flat therefore it is and that can give me a, a truth answer about it. And so mysticism has a very similar approach to that. So yeah, um, my interest this evening is, you know, is it a good way to find out truth? Um, and if we use, if people are being attracted to ways um, of evaluating the world that don't give us good ways of um, evaluating truth, is that something we should be concerned about? Is that a worry we should have? But I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and uh, just a reminder again, so please do put your questions in the chat. Uh, finally, um, if we can go to our third panelist, Deborah Hyde. Hello, good evening. Um, thank you for having me this evening. Um, yeah, that was great. I think it was really perceptive, a great setup by, um, by Richie and really perceptive by Andrew. I'd like to follow on with what Andrew said because uh, I think we have this kind of artificial snobbering in place about how valid your belief system is if you go to church or if you go to mosque and you follow a ritual that has been prescribed by people with qualifications that you are somehow um, more sensible more conventional uh, and that you're following some human wisdom and that it's a grown-up thing to do whereas if you read tarot cards or um, do crystals or you throw uh, salt over your left hand or your left shoulder to avoid bad luck that these are somehow kind of frivolous I would put them all in the same category, albeit that there are huge differences between them. But I think I think people looking from the um, from the outside can get lost in a bit of snobbery. I think that um, you know fairies are as uh, respectable as God is, um, and what we know from studies over the years is that people who tend to believe, well, first of all, your ability to believe in something that's slightly exotic does depend rather on your environment. There were studies done, for example, in the USA and in Poland, which were very strongly religious countries for their own particular reasons. And under those circumstances, it was socially deprecated to just kind of go wild and to extemporize and to develop your own beliefs. So the degree to which you, you can explore these things, um, anything other than privately, is uh, is a luxury and it depends on your environment. Also, the things that you tend to go for as um, a kind of alternative belief will depend an awful lot 
on demographic type stuff. For example, uh, women, if they are going for slightly more exotic beliefs, will be going for crystal healing or psi powers, for example. Whereas if men are going a little bit off the grid, they'll be more likely to be, believe in UFO experiences or Bigfoot. Um, so there, there are parallels with people's, uh, people's lived experience and the choices of alternate experiences that they choose to go for. Um, so really it's a matter of your personal experience of the world, whether you can actually get away with it in your social context. There will always be, for psychological reasons, a core of people, um, Andrew made a, a reference to it actually, different types of religiosity. William James thought that religion came from the core of a religious genius, somebody who actually experienced it, and then that contagiously went to other people. We don't necessarily go for that these days. We think that people have different ways of being religious or superstitious and that they get different things out of it. Some people have personal mystical experiences, for example. Um, some people feel that it's valuable to belong to a congregation and to get the social benefits that you get from that, or it's just the right thing to do. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we all have different ways of seeing the world and there will be a core group of people who will be really predisposed to some quite funky experiences However, whether those funky experiences become part of the normal mainstream talk depends really very much on the circumstances surrounding them. So um, you can't rely on kind of psychopathologies to explain all of this. Really, I think you have to look at the, uh, the social and I would imagine these days financial environments that people believe in to understand exactly why they get where they are right now. Does that help? That does. Thank you very much, Deborah. So what we are going to do is we're going to move on to a QA. and a Now, my first question that I had written down that we were going to ask was, why do people hold mystical beliefs? But I sort of feel like Deborah's just been talking about that for a few minutes. So I think maybe we'll just move on to something slightly different. And we might come back to that depending on what uh, comes out in the discussion. And so to what extent do you think the increased interest in mysticism uh, actually reflects people in changes um, in belief. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll go back to Richie and I'll ask him that first and then we'll move on to the panel. Um, I don't know. Um, I think, yeah, I think it, it so I think I think Deborah was onto something actually potentially that that, that that the loosening of religion is a necessary condition um, before people can you know start going off and exploring other things and perhaps as, as people become less and less religious and uh, fewer and fewer people far, find that they have to have these formal structures um, kind of put upon them um, that 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 will mean that more and more people will explore other things and that includes mysticism um, yeah. and um, but. It, you know, it is still hard to say from there um, how seriously people take that. I think there's a great spectrum. One thing that I meant to mention earlier, but didn't obviously, is that if you look into witch talk, for example, as, a, as I alluded to at the start, it's clear that quite a lot of people who are engaging in that particular phenomenon, I think, are not taking it seriously because lots of the memes appear to be more based in various fandoms like Harry Potter. Um, but um, I, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll we'll see over time. I think we are one of the least religious uh, countries in the world. Um, we're also um, amongst the very least religious countries for um, people being that religious because of reasons of freedom. So, you know, if you contrast it with, for example, the Soviet Union or China, there might be a high number of non-religious people there, but it's not because um, they, um, they, they necessarily are free to believe what they like. Um, and so that um, increase in freedom that we have is, is an experiment in a way. It's, some, it's an unprecedented thing. There's not, there's not data as to what happens in a, in a mature, non-religious democracy um, when you take things, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from where we are now. So we'll really have to see how these things develop. So I'm just going to go back to Deborah. Um, so um, do, you, do you have a sort of reflection on whether or not that increasing criticism mysticism is because people have actually changed their underlying beliefs? 
Um, I I would dispute from the figures whether or not there is a whether there is a large increase in mysticism. Right. Uh, so I, I you know so far I would say Richie's done a great job of of sort of putting together what we know and we're we're not absolutely certain we're sure that conventional religiosity certainly is declining. Uh, what does it mean for what people actually believe? In general, I would say that to find that young people. Um, indulge in uh, mystical or uh, empowering alternate forms of reality is not at all unusual. Uh, it probably it's in general belief in in everything really you know religion, not religious compliance maybe, but certainly belief in an awful lot of things decline with age, and that's been thought to be down to several reasons. First of all, people become more adept at spotting sleight of hand. You know, you just don't believe your priest is the most moral person in the village. Um, and the other thing is that you, the, the kind of compensations which mysticism offers become less necessary as you get older. You have no power and you have no money when you're younger. And this is, it, it's understandable if someone resorts to the tarot when they have nothing else. And Andrew's before we move on. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to take it in a slightly different direction. I think that um, it kind of reflects a change in society as a whole. Um, if we look at the world we're, we're in at the moment, everything's about new ways of doing things. There's new ways of working. There's, you know, uh, people are, especially young people, are very much uh, making new paths for themselves. There's social media. You can become famous by doing that. There's, you know, there's lots of things where you can take it your personal way, not following the trend. And I think that mysticism is very much that with relation to religion. You know, religious ways of doing things have, have got set paths. You know, you've got these rules you have to follow and stuff. And people are going, well, I don't need to do that. I can do it my way. I want to, I, I still want, I'm still interested in the same things. I still feel that there's more to life than just being a biological thing there's a spiritual you know element to it and I want to investigate that but I don't have to do it the way that everyone's done it before I can find my own way and I think that yeah it's it's a it's a bigger thing in culture we, we're very much uh, becoming more focused on individuals and you know the value of the individual rather than the group and um and I think that this is just the religious side of it. I don't think you can really take it away from you know, society as a whole. So it's essentially, it's not actually that there's any, you know, it, obviously there's the debate about whether there is a, an increase, there's increase in certain things, maybe there's not an increase in other things, but as in it's, it's more that if you've got a more individualist society, then you're kind of non, non-rational whatever term you want to use but the, the sort of things which you wouldn't which you wouldn't expect skeptics believe they are more likely to they're going to change in their nature as well um, yeah as things go wrong yeah no it's fair enough and um, so um do you think do you think that um i mean we'll go back to you actually andrew about this one and um, do you think that this uh, the, the interest in mysticism that we see at the moment you know, whether that's going up or down do you think it's an aesthetic thing or do you think it's a more deep-rooted thing and i appreciate you've sort of covered that a little bit with what you've said already um but i mean how much of it do you think is people just going i quite like you know they like the the sort of looking like someone who likes all this stuff and how much do you think i genuinely believe that crystals are healing uh Honestly, I have no idea on that. Um, I, that I found that I was trying to find some kind of information on that um, and I found it a really difficult question to ask because obviously um, you're relying on people telling you uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so someone can, you know, so, uh, I suppose it, 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 it has a similarity to any kind of, you know, I don't, I don't want to use the word fad in a, in a negative way, sort of any Thing that people get involved in there's always different degrees there's the people there's always the people who are like oh my god this is the most important thing in the world i should definitely yeah. focus all my energy on this and then there's also the people who are like that but guy's cool i'm going to hang around with him and you know and do the same sort of thing so i think it, i think whether people are genuine in their beliefs i'm not sure that's a question you can ask i think that's a question we could ask of any kind of religion um you know i i grew up in the, 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 the church and um, I still know many religious people 
and I know people who are at church, and you know, not at the moment, but you know, would be at church every Sunday, uh, prayer groups and things like that, but then also other people who equally claim to be Christian who never walked into a church. And so um, I think it's a difficult question to ask, and I think especially as outsiders, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I personally don't feel like I've got much insight on that. Um, Richie or Deborah, do you think, yeah, is there anything else you want to answer that or is it a similar sort of answer of actually, I don't think you can answer that question? Which specific question was that? And so is in um, about whether or not it's aesthetic or whether it is deep, whether mysticism is um, based on deep, more deep rooted beliefs. Oh, right. Well, it could be aesthetic because let's face it, goths look really cool. Uh, that's just my own personal opinion, but um, um, yeah, it, it's possibly a mixture of both. But I think that the urge to uh, the urge to find meaning, especially when you're young, yeah. is so very, very strong that uh, just because you know someone happens to look cool at the same time, I'm, my guess is it's not just that. It, it's a search for meaning and, and agency, actually. Yeah, Rich, is anything else you want to add? Yeah, well, I. I... I think I slightly said it in, in my presentation, but to say it again, I, I agree with Andrew that I think it's very difficult to say. Um, I, there's not really much good research out there. It seems that in some cases it's clearly um, an aesthetic thing uh, when it comes to some related phenomena, but for other people, um, some people seem to have been into crystal healing for, for some young people for some time now and, and, and spend quite a lot of their time focused on it. So at some point for some people, it may cross over um, into uh, something more. Um, if you think about kind of, you know, so at one end of that, the kind of whole crystal healing mysticism thing, for some people it crosses into kind of pagan and Wicca, and there's not any noticeable trend in more people saying they're pagan or Wicca um, amongst younger people compared to um, amongst the population as a whole. And overall, that's still a very small trend. You know, we're talking about uh, easily less than 1% of the population will say they're pagan um, or. At Wicca. Um, I found it interesting what Deborah said that um, younger people might be more into, into experimenting with these things and um, that's that's interesting to know. Um, it, I, I've always thought that certain conspiracy theories um, uh, like you know the QAnon conspiracy theory um, actually tend to uh, uh, be things that latch on to um, slightly older demographics more um, who um, it seems have not been uh, have not grown up with the internet and might not be so good um, uh, when it comes to critical thinking on the internet um, and the need to be always skeptical of, of, of different claims. Um, so um, these two different trends then, you know, seem to be at polar opposite ends of the spectrum and happening for perhaps slightly different reasons. And uh, that's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing about QAnon as well is, is I would bet it's, it's more of a male pursuit than a female pursuit, for example, and that crystal healing would be more of a female pursuit. So there are, there are definitely demographic differences. That's really, um, that's really interesting. So I guess the next thing to ask is, I guess I'm going to go to Richie first with this, um, is do you think it's something that as humanists we need to be concerned about? And I suppose specifically, actually, do you think it's something that Humanists UK is particularly concerned about? Um, uh, sorry. sorry yeah, I don't know why I had that erm in there because I finished No, 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 that's all right. Um, yeah, well, I think, I think it, it only is to the extent to which it leads to impact on policy. So um, if to, to the extent to which some groups, and I think in my experience, this is mainly Christian groups, try to claim that the non-religious bloc are in some way not really non-religious, uh, in some way they're still religious because they might have spiritual beliefs. Um, and therefore the state should carry on giving preferential treatment to Christians in you know, uh, schooling or pastoral care or, um, or, or religion in parliament, then, then that's a problem, clearly. Um, and that needs to be combated. And I think there are two ways to do that. Number one is to point out, uh, well, this is what my side show. Number one is to point out that um, uh, many religious people, um, by some metrics, most aren't conventionally religious. And number two is to point out that the majority of the population uh, advocates for uh, more a more liberal, um, uh, progressive, um, secular society, um, whether that you know whether that that be the um, non-religious share of the population or a um, religious share of the population. Uh, it's quite famous, of course, that um, uh, Catholics are generally uh, pro-choice, but that's that kind of 
you know, answer to public service is actually true for um, certainly uh, Christian groups, uh, basically across the board on almost any issue you can ask them about. Um, and that's a really important message just to keep keep repeating and make sure that people don't like, you know, that like Theos, for example, as I showed on my side, don't just stop at the point of persuading you that actually some of the non religious are really religious and then yeah. and then draw all sorts of conclusions from that. Enough. So, um, uh, Andrew, can I just ask you the same thing? So, um, you know, do you think as humanists we need to be worried about it? Um, again, it's it's the answer. I think is when it uh, you know comes into play in other aspects. I mean, I'm a very much a live and let live guy. You know, if if you want to hold mystical beliefs and stuff like that, you know, I'm generally fine with it. I don't have a a big issue, but what I think it does become a problem is when the kind of thinking that you engage in in one area affects other areas. So whether it's you know your way you vote uh, politically and things like that, or the way you uh, approach you know other aspects of uh, of the world, you know science and and the like. You know, do you do you have a rational and consistent approach to um, evaluating problems? So for example. Um, you know, conspiracy theories are brought up there's there's a lot of research on the psychology of conspiracy theories and and they basically look at the way that they evaluate the world in a different way different different aspects are important for their uh, people who believe in a lot in a lot of conspiracy theories compared to people who don't and i think i i, I would be very much unsurprised if um the same applied to uh, people who hold mystical beliefs um I, I yeah I, I think my, my my concern is you know if you're uh, believing in things like psychic healings and crystals and things like that because of um, you think that uh, your your personal experience with something is a good way to evaluate the truth things like that does that have risks you know um, we we know that there are risks to people who get into um, like homeopathy and the like, who think that that's a really good way to treat sickness and they will avoid treating uh, you know, cancer with tr more traditional types of medicine like you know, chemotherapy and that like, and, and focus on the alternative ones. And obviously that has risks. And I think, you know, it's the same, it's the same mindset as far as I see it. Yeah, Brett, anything you want to add? Yes, I, I would say exactly the same thing, is that it really does depend, um, to, really this stuff matters uh, to the extent that it affects public policy, and the whole point about witches and crystal healers is that they're as easy to herd as cats are, usually, so that's where um, conventional churches represent far more of a threat because they are politically organised, and uh, as Richie's pointed out to us, can uh, make it sound as though they represent a great many more people than they do even when they're representing the opposite point of view. Um, it's, we, I, I was on Woman's Hour a few years ago with um, a healer who uh, offered to heal people from terminal cancer. And um, she operated in Ireland. And you should have seen the look on her face when I reminded her that the reason her, her patients had to go over there was because it was illegal to make such claims here. Um, she wasn't very happy with me at all. And that is an example of great policy where the government has intervened and said, look, you know, you dance around fairy rings all you want, but as soon as you start making verifiable claims, you know, non-provable claims, scientific claims about things that you can do on behalf of people who are dying, you're not allowed to. In my, in my opinion, it should be extended beyond. It, that was, um, cancer is a specific uh, example. It's a very old act that um, fake medicine applies to, and I, I think it should be expanded for other things. Um, so yes, it, it matters to the degree that public policy uh, and people who can influence public policy matter. That's interesting, because if we're going to go back to QAnon, that actually, the QAnon thing, which is very hard to centralise, it's hard to kind of hit it with any specific hammer, that is having an effect on voting and politics. So. I mean, potentially this stuff is is worrying, yeah. So that does actually, it does actually bring me on to the next thing, the thing I wanted to move on to. Before I go on to that, I'm just going to remind people, and um, if you are asking questions in the chat, um, please do say, I'd like to ask this myself, or I'd like to ask it on camera. I appreciate a lot of people will have put that information in 
having forgotten that. So I will briefly ask people if they want to be on camera when they ask their questions during the key Q and A, or you know, just talk. Um, but if you could put that in, it'll just speed things up a little bit. And um, so the, the thing I was going to ask was, um, on the back of all that, do you think, as Richie demonstrated at the start, there is an increase in the number of people who are saying they are non-religious, and you know, we're not quite clear, is there an increase in mysticism, is there not? It's a little bit sort of worthy. Do you think that as a, you know, as a country, as a site, whatever you, however you want to put it, that our critical thinking skills in terms of our abilities to, you know, be sceptical about stuff, do you think that has improved with time? As in, if you looked at us now compared to 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, do you think we've got better at that? you know, that, that way of approaching problems. Um, Andrew, let me go to you first, just because I don't think I've gone to you first so far, so. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I'd very much like to say yes. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that is the right answer. Um, I think we, every year science education improves, you know, people's interest in science. You just need to look up, you know, the shows they're putting on the BBC. There's so many documentaries on science and things like that. You know, people are interested in science in general. Uh, people have uh, understanding of the benefits of it. Um, so I think that, you know, it's, it's harder to just, you know, dismiss, you know, the fact that having a critical thinking scientific approach to things does have you know, tangible beneficial effects. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I see a lot of, uh, you know, as we've, we've, we keep coming back to QAnon and stuff like that. I mean, admittedly, that's mainly in America and stuff, but we do see um, rises in conspiracy theories. There are, you know, um, my, my personal favorite flat earth conspiracies are, uh, have been on the rise recently. And, um, you know, more, you know, YouTube has become the home of conspiracy theories. It's, um, non-skeptical thinking um and different approaches to things to sort of um the rejection of the you know the scientific way of thinking you know it's not not possible for me to build a large hadron collider and test these things for myself therefore why should i accept them um i think that yes there is there is unfortunately a bit of a backlash going on at the moment to sort of the scientific critical thinking approach um whether whether that's just sort of you know whether the amount of it is is bigger or whether just the coverage of it is bigger it's difficult to tell but there's definitely you know, you definitely don't have to look very far to come across conspiracy theories and non-skeptical thinking these days deborah can i ask your opinion about that um i really don't know and we would need to do some surveys and I think it would be very beneficial to do them. Uh, I went to school approximately 250 years ago so I can, I can only um, speak for the relatively dire kind of way of being educated that I had. We were very much told what was true rather than how yeah. we came by the evidence. Um, I did I did solid science A-levels, and it wasn't until I was in the second year of science A-levels that we kind of even got a bit to the philosophy of it, of what, what science, you know, what, what even constitutes a scientific question. So there are lots of questions you can ask that just, you, you know, you can't prove or disprove them, so they don't even matter. Um, and in addition to that, in our country specifically, because we don't do baccalaureates, because we specialise extremely early and we can, as I did when I was 13, this is unbelievable, was able to give up history, means that people don't have a good even spread of, stu of subjects. Um, and perhaps, I don't know, hopefully it's getting better, but perhaps they don't have um, a background in the in how we come by knowledge, not just what it is. My, my niece did very good uh, history GCSE, where she was, you know, I was going, oh, I'll tell you all about the Wars of the Roses, go and ask me. And, what, and, and I couldn't because what she was doing was she was comparing three different documents and working out 
which who you know what everybody's yeah. angle was on it what the reality was likely to be that is good education and um our degree uh, the ability to which you know we can sort really the, the wheat from the chaff out will depend on that kind of education i don't know whether people are getting it or not yeah i mean i, th I think it is interesting i mean i I, I don't know where this puts me in the sort of when people were educated. I did my airports walk 16 ish years ago, and I certainly do my GCSEs a couple of I remember doing a bit on primary versus secondary sources, and you know, do you think this happened? Do you think that yeah, happened? But it that's wasn't, really great. It, it, yeah, which was good, but it wasn't the bulk of what I did. It was like a little bit where they showed you what historians did, and then it was here is a list of facts that you need to learn. So it, it's interesting, isn't it? And um, Richie, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, you've made me reflect on my own time at school and I think my history was actually probably better on this than my science, um, having done uh, both to GCSE. Um, I think that, um, yeah, so the, the internet, um, not, so we've already talked about how the, the, the decline in religion may mean that people might be freer to go off and explore other beliefs and obviously the internet gives them uh, the, uh, the, the the spaces to discover where where people are doing just that and, and things to latch onto so people are able to form communities that wouldn't have been possible before um, and uh, um, I, I think we talked a bit earlier about how um, for young people perhaps who've grown up with the internet they may be more skeptical um, because uh, they've they, 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 they've known all along that not everything on the internet is true and it's very much you know easier to realize that when um, when you're more tech savvy um, than perhaps when you're older and you weren't in the past um, exposed to um, claims um, that were so untested. You know, there was a filter of the news media that things had to go to before they got to you. And, uh, and so you expected that the information you'd received when you're, um, you know, um, in, in that kind of receiving mode uh, would be uh, to a certain standard. Um, having said all of that, I do think that the science education in schools um, hasn't really got better and uh, in, a, in a while or, or not enough. I remember in 2012 when the UK government last reviewed the English, um, the, the national curriculum in English schools um, and um, they were reviewing the science uh, curriculum. We, we did a lot of work trying to get them to put all the all the stuff about knowledge um, and um, how scientists actually know what's true and what isn't um, into um, into the science curriculum, you know, everything from uh, double blinding and randomized controlled trials to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the stuff about falsifiability and so on. Um, and uh, very little of that is in there. So um, if schools are teaching better um, the kinds of things that are in, you know, bad science, for example, then that would, might be down to individual teachers. Unfortunately, it's still not the case that the national curriculum has got to where it needs to be on these things. And that's obviously only becoming more important given the internet um, and, and that lack of filters that I mentioned earlier. I mean, so, I, mean I, I didn't really mention it at the top of my day job is on a doctor, um, I'm a critical care doctor. So, you know, obviously being able to, having a populace which is a little bit more educated makes your life a little bit easier because, you know, they can understand, there's a little bit of common language in terms of how people understand what you're talking to them about. And I think it also more generally means you can be better at critical thinking. But it, it's just, the reason I asked the question was, I thought it might be that there's a drop in religiosity, but if you're seeing, whether it's an increase, whether it's staying the same, don't know, mysticism exactly. I, I just thought it was interesting to reflect on actually has that changed how people approach the world or is it just that religion isn't the thing they're you know expressing their non-skeptical sort of uh, you know beliefs in? so what i'm going to do is I'm going to turn some of the questions in the chat and um, uh first question the question i'm going to ask is from uh, jonathan uh i can't tell if that's i-l-e-s or l-l-e-s or what because of the font but i'm going to go with I -L -E -S. I -L -E -S. Um, I -L -E -S. Fantastic. Um, and uh, he uh, has asked, um, would it be fair to say that the increase in mysticism and spirituality is a natural result of the social expectation of formal religion being relaxed? I think having asked that question, I've realised we've probably discussed that a little bit. Um, we discussed a little bit of scepticism around whether or not there is actually increase in mysticism. We talked about how it's a different thing. Is there anything else anybody wants to add or do we think we've covered that? No, shakes of heads, that's absolutely fine. And um, there is a couple of questions which I'm kind of going to amalgamate into one, which is just about the point of, obviously, you know, Andrew, I think you mentioned it, talking about personal experiences trumping other evidence. 
what about the reflection that obviously, you know, it certainly is, you know, I'm a doctor, I, a lot of the stuff I do is just from repeat, you know, admittedly repeated, but lots and lots of anecdotal evidence about stuff. How does that fit in, in terms of critical thinking and approaching things in an evidence-based way, in terms of the way that you might talk to somebody about that and how you apply that to mysticism? And I don't know if there's anybody who wants to sort of tackle that first, I'm, I'm sort of looking at, I know you can't tell I'm looking at you, I'm sort of looking at Andrew because uh, he, he brought it up, but I don't know if there's anybody who wants to jump in first. Go I'll go first. <laughs> um, yes, it's a really good point. Um, I mean, obviously everything we do is personal experience. So, you know, whether we're sitting reading scientific papers or, you know, you know, meditating or whatever, uh, it's all going to be personal experience. I think um, the way I see it, is whether you will what exactly are you relying on so with um something like you said where you do um do something over and over again you are uh i think the right way to put it because obviously people meditate over and over again they you know, can argue that they're learning the skill that way um i think it's it's whether it how it fits with the information we already know so if we have uh, lots of scientific evidence showing that X is true and that we base um, ideas and methods around the what the evidence shows. Um, someone's personal experience um, of meditating and coming to the conclusion that X is false doesn't, for me, carry in as much weight. You know, uh, yes, okay, you, you've got the person who's doing an experiment in the lab and that's their personal experience and someone meditating and coming to the opposite conclusion. And I think the one that has a more um, foundational, uh, a scientific approach, a more demonstrable evidence in support of it is, is the stronger claim, even if they are both personal experience claim. I feel like I'm getting away from the question a bit, so I might let the other guys have a, have a go at it no, before I oh, waffle in. No, I think you were sort of on the money and it's something I've reflected on my own practice to be honest but and Deborah I don't know if you want to add thing. Um, I was the psychologist Susan Blackmore has done an awful lot about um, alternate states of consciousness uh, and you can if you're prepared to put the work in you can experience them some people are more predisposed than others and um, really kind of what, what your experience of the world is is a mixture of your sort of uh, bottom-up experiences, you know, your sense of bodily uh, integrity and the, the stuff that's, that's going through your, you know, the, the, the light themes you're getting in, and then top-down uh, heuristics, the way that your mind, the shortcuts that your software is making of the meaning of it. And so you can have some pretty funky experiences um, and decide that they're not supernatural. I have had loads of out-of-body experiences um, that it's learnable, the learnable skill. Um, Sue has had a great many more funky experiences than I have, and she is still a, a very scientifically sort of materially based science person. So um, what you what you make, it, it's generally appreciated that the, the core of um, mystical and paranormal beliefs come from, a lot of them come from personal experience, but what you make of them does depend on uh, what your notions are about the way the world acts. And if you have access to this neuropsychological model of human beings, uh, then you might, you know, one person might make um, a sort of a, you know, one person might think they've had temporal lobe epilepsy, another person might think they were visited by God. So it's, you know, it's your social context. I think it's interesting fact that with critical care patients, obviously this is illness and drug induced, but they, you know, you talk to somebody who's on critical care for more than, you know, especially if they've been sedated, and lots of them will have delirious experiences and they feel real. They genuinely believe they're there. Um, and it's not, a, you know, it's not like a dream. It is like, I can see, and, you know, and sometimes they, if they're in the middle of that, they can actually talk about, I can see these things on the wall. So they have, they, they, find it, they are actually aware that they're not real. So it's, it's really interesting to-, um, to and, Absolutely. And, and there are also, um, there's an awful lot of work to show that anomalous experiences are reasonably normal experience for a lot of the psychologically healthy population as well. Uh, auditory experiences of, of not uncommon, 
Um, and so, you know, it, it depends on how extreme they are for you and how you can integrate them with your world model as to whether or not you're going to end up um, with medical care or just coping. Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes you forget how big the normal range is, really. Yeah. Um, Richie, anything you want to add on? Well, I don't really know, coming back to your original question, whether or not uh, people are getting better at, um, at, at separating their personal experience and, and seeing where that might contradict with contradict the evidence overall. Um, I feel like we're we're giving you a lot of I don't knows between us tonight, um, you know, because but these are these are these are difficult questions. Um, I hope, though, that um, uh, some of the vested interests in society, um, like if you think back several hundred years, you know, powerful, or even a hundred years, or you know, and even to some extent today, obviously le less and less over time, but to, to some extent, powerful religious groups who might have vested interests against um, teaching certain types of critical thinking um, or teaching certain things as true, um, that may, as a consequence, allow in beliefs that perhaps even you know are ones that those religious groups themselves don't actually adhere to. Um, though if, as those kinds of vested interests go away, uh, maybe at some stage that will mean that the, the state will grasp the nettle and become better at teaching well about critical thinking and that may lead to a more educated population. So I suppose I might be optimistic overall um, about the direction of travel, but that, that yeah. isn't to say I know exactly where we are right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's very good. I mean, it's one of the reasons I've asked this. I genuinely didn't know if anyone knew the answer to the question. Um, uh, and sometimes they're the most interesting questions to ask. But I think it's interesting to reflect on um, on that. And um, so um, uh, uh, Shana W um, asks, um, could it simply be that all fringe beliefs uh, uh, on the rise nowadays is due to the proliferation of social media and the ease of sharing ideas online so that ideas that used to be relegated to the fringe are now more readily available. I've very slightly rephrased the question because I think we sort of came to the conclusion that actually we don't know if fringe belief or rather we don't know if certainly mysticism is on the on the rise but do you think the fact that we still you know there seems to be a tendency to have fringe ideas that people are more aware of more engaged with do you think that is to do with um uh, basically the internet and social media. So um, I'm going to go to Deborah first. Um, I, I don't know, but it would be surprising if it, if it didn't, wouldn't it? I mean, it would be surprising if forms of communication hadn't incre increased um, beliefs in all sorts of things. I, the contagion of ideas is very important. And every time we have had a chance to be contagious with our ideas, whether it's by telegraph or by you know, big tent revival meetings or television. There was um, post-war in this country, actually, there was a huge increase just in interest in mysticism in general. And uh, paperbacks were cheap, telly was coming in, radio shows. There were lots of uh, horror stories on, on radio. You could just sort of, you know, people, um, pe people just reading them out for you. Uh, so I think every time we have had some form of medium that's enabled us to communicate with each other, we've used it to do this stuff. So why not now? Yeah, fair enough. And um, so, uh, Richie. Yeah, and then I suppose the uh, corollary to that is uh, where do we go from here? I mean, when it comes to some of the um, trends that Deborah referred to, you know, back in the 30s, there's then a backlash. And uh, at the moment, of course, in, in many ways, we're seeing a backlash against the unregulated state of the big social networks. Um, will that result in uh, tighter regulation of Facebook and uh, Twitter, or perhaps them adopting tighter self-regulation? And if it does, may that have an impact on this? May, may uh, the internet, as a, you know, it's very easy to think of the, the, the current trends just continuing um, because the underlying technology or the underlying societal conditions stay static, um, but that's obviously not the case. And um, uh, uh, as technology continues to evolve and change and as society and the way society deals with technology um, and the internet changes, um, it may be that um, actually we find uh, that, that, that things go into reverse at some point before too long. And Andrew, I don't know if you want to add a thing. Yeah, I mean, I personally think that yes, the answer is definitely yes. The internet has played a, a major role in bringing people together with ideas like this. Um, I'm going to talk about Flat Earth again because I can't help it. I think I'm obsessed with it at the moment. But there's um, been a number of uh, small papers out where they've discussed, uh, talked to people who believe in the Flat Earth. And almost universally, they will say that they, they came to Flat Earth via YouTube. 
that social media played a massive role in them actually finding out that this thing was even a thing and then teaching them about it. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if the same is true for uh, other sort of uh, more fringe beliefs. Um, there's the channel on YouTube called Spirit Science, which is all the woo in one place. Um, and it has hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And so I imagine that there are many channels like that out there and Facebook groups and things. So yes, so as far as I'm concerned, yes, internet is a massive role to play. It's, it's, I mean, it flattered something. One of my friends briefly got obsessed with, um, uh, there was a, a Facebook page, not that he believed this, but there was a Facebook page that followed another Facebook page, which was about urine therapy, which is one of these woo things that I'm sure you probably, you know, the three of you, are, you know, probably have come across, but basically drinking urine in order to, and he just kept sending me like, you know, all this weird stuff that people had done with their urine. Uh, if anyone's wondering, I'm pretty sure I'll say, Brand, don't drink your urine, it's bad for you. Um, you know, don't do that. Um, so, um, uh, so next thing uh, I was going to move to was um, where were we? So Rebecca had a question which I think we've kind of covered, which was, do you think there is an argument that younger people might be more drawn to things such as tarot and astrology because they're still trying to figure out who they are and they think these things will offer answers? I think Deborah kind of covered that. I mean, unless uh, there's anything particularly Andrew or Richie wanted to add to that. No, that's absolutely fair enough. And um, so it's an interesting question that um, Edward has asked. And um, regarding the idea of modern spirituality being linked to new ways of doing things, I'm wondering what people's opinions are on, uh, on the idea that modern spirituality is actually going back to the practices of things like meditation or Greek stoicism philosophy. Now, that's slightly outside my area of expertise, but I don't know if there's anybody who, you know, wants to jump in on that. I could do that if you like. Yeah, um, is that all right, Deborah? Just touch on it. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, th this comes down to how do you define spirituality and is religion the same as spirituality and all of that kind of thing. Um, I think there are a couple of uh, sort of psychological urges in human beings that uh, need to be fulfilled, whether by mystical means or not. One is um, a sense of finding meaning, especially for suffering, because most people at most times do suffer rather badly. Um, and uh, the other is to try and find some kind of agency and sometimes the meaning means you don't need the agency because you're you're happy to surrender it and um, so uh, I you, you know we, we have a, a certain rather limited repertoire of tricks uh, and they manifest themselves in many many different ways this is why I, I just kind of it's difficult to take a religion seriously when it feels as though it's come to a primal truth because it's usually just, you know, another manifestation of a pattern that has been repeated again and again, and that the dressing is not different enough to actually persuade people who study religion um, that it really is truly different or separate or a revelation. Uh, so, yes, I, I would think that, um, you know, the, the types of religiosity that people get involved with um, like, for example, if you think about the, the in the 19th century, um, the, there was a great opening of all of the land to the west of New York State, just and it was a technological thing. The Erie Canal was put through the mountains, and so it meant that people could go and live in places like Ohio and Indiana and places they couldn't go before in great numbers. So these huge numbers of people being sh uh, shipped out there. Um, living in very, very arduous situations, and they had not only an average human need, but a very high human need for the kinds of things that religion and spiritual practices would give them, except they had a distinct shortage of institutional religion to provide it. So that is when you get the big tent revival meetings and the very charismatic people try and get sort of like, you know, a crowd at a time people. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, our, our religious repertoire is consists of a certain number of things, and you can see them uh, occurring in different circumstances. And and once you once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I suppose if you then couple that with the out of body experiences that you were talking about, that you've been through, um, that um, what was the name of the Was it Susan Blackmore? 
Sue Blackmore, um, yeah. That she's done, that Sue Blackmore has done you know, lots of, as you've said. Once you couple those things and provide your, exper your explanation for them through spirituality, I suppose that's quite powerful in convincing people that this stuff exists, basically. Well, it's incredibly powerful because also if you know how to provide someone with an anomalous experience that's usually associated with sleep deprivation, even really mild sleep deprivation in the case of out of body experiences, um, or, you know, dehydration or something like that, and you've got the formula and you can then um, you, you can then enable other people to have it, but you don't give them yeah. the formula, you, they, they'll think you're magic. Absolutely. Fair enough. That's really interesting. I, I'm, I'm in a doctor, so I'm sleep deprived all the time. Uh, I'm a junior doctor, so I'm definitely sleep deprived. Oh, right, yeah, all the time. So definitely had some, had a few out yeah, definitely had some out of body experiences. You probably <laughs> are looking after people, sadly. Um, so, um, uh, Richie Andrews, anything you want to add? Um, yeah, I, mean, I just want to um, sort of follow up from uh, what Deborah was saying. Um, I know I personal anecdote here. When I was younger, I had. Um, uh, sleep paralysis event where you know I for people who don't know it was I essentially was still asleep but was conscious and my body was locked I couldn't move and I was utterly convinced that there was a demon at the bottom of my bed and it was at the time the most terrifying experience I'd ever had and because I was religious at the time I interpreted it in that light and I very much uh, clearly remember in my head calling out to Jesus and the feeling went away. And for me, that was a profound experience that probably kept me believing in um, Christianity for a lot longer than it, I would have if I hadn't had that. Uh, that Because I, 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 I was kind of starting to question my faith at the time and then suddenly Jesus saved me from a demon. And you know, uh, so yeah, um, now having a better understanding of the psychology of that and understanding how that these are you know, fairly common experiences they're brought on as deborah said by sort of lack of sleep stress even sleeping on your back can um, cause these things to happen um it it's i think i'd have a very different experience now i'd know what was happening and even though you would you, you would still find it scary because the parts of your brain that interpret it properly are kind of still asleep um yeah, I can totally understand where, you know, experiences like that can really have a profound effect on people. Is it OK yeah, if I just add oh, something? Yeah, sorry, I know it isn't my turn. Um, yeah, no, that, I think that was a really good thing for Andrew to bring up because um, most Catholic priests and Anglican priests would not be so gauche and dumb if you had had a, a sleep paralysis experience to actually say that you had been haunted by a demon. But there are, because I, 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 I've, I've engaged with churches on this, more sort of um, uh, evangelical um, revival type churches will confirm to you that you have been attacked, perhaps sexually attacked by a demon. And I do think that there is a case uh, in circumstances like that for there to be a law. Why not? If you, if you can't claim that you can, uh, that you can cure people of cancer with, you know, with your whatever rays you've got, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, you, you should not be able to confirm to people that they've been suffering with demons when the scientific answer is so well known and so well established. I mean, that, that's a really good case for, for a law. That's abuse of people. Richie. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And um, we do some work around uh, particularly advertising and state funding, which I think is kind of the front line of of that battle when it comes to both uh, either religious groups or, or, or alternative medicine. Um, coming back to the previous question, actually, the one that none of us, you know, directly attempted to answer, I did actually want to add some, one thing to do with that, which is that um, when I was looking into, um, uh, you know, the evidence around this, um, one thing I found actually was uh, how belief in the zodiac has changed over time, um, which I left out of my initial slides because uh, it, it wasn't directly relevant uh, then, but it's clearly relevant in the directions the conversation has gone. Um, and uh, the British Social Attitude Survey, again, asked about this in 1993 and 2005. So two somewhat old data points, um, but, um, and you know, the rise of the internet may have changed things since, but what, what the results were was quite striking. So in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1993, 44% um, of people said that they thought they had a lot or a little more in common uh, with people who were the same sign of the Zodiac. 
as them. Uh, but by 2005, this had plummeted to 17%. Um, and 83% uh, now said that they had no more in common with them than, than anyone else. Um, so um, when it comes to the Zodiac, at least, that massively went out of fashion in that, in that time period. Um, and um, I'm not sure why the Zodiac might be any more or less appealing than mysticism, uh, crystals and uh, witch talk. Um, but um, it does suggest that there may be some slightly cyclical thing to these things. Um, and yeah, I suppose we'll have to see whether or not that, that's true. Of I, I suspect case. this is a um, age and um, uh, sort of culturally specific thing, but I blame Mystic Meg. So <laughs> um, if you don't know who Mystic Meg is, uh, when the National Lottery was on in the 90s, she was someone who used to do horoscopes on TV. Um, I say that slightly more seriously, but it, it, I, it is interesting. I bet all of us know what our sign on the Zodiac is, despite the fact there's absolutely no evidence that you know it, it's, uh, it, it, it exists. Um, so um, Zach Cash uh, asked, uh, I'm going to slightly just shorten his questions, make it a little bit easier, but in the way that there are Christians who go, you know, you're not a very good Christian because you don't believe in this stuff, uh, you know, as well as I do. Um, do you think if mysticism does start to increase in it, or more people start to adhere to mystical ideas, or even now if it does exist, is that a thing that you've seen happening, i.e. people gatekeeping um, mystical ideas? Um, Andrew, you're nodding your head, so I'm going to chat to you first. Definitely stop doing that. Head, um, <laughs> I, I think I think so. Yeah, I think that's that's likely something we'll see. I mean, we, we see it in so many other areas. Um, it, you know, people. It, it, it's kind of um, how. Well, if you bring it back to religion, it's how, how you end up with different sects. You know, someone. So you have one part of the the church who says we should do it this way, and one part that says we do it this way, and then you branch off and you have different. Thing. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if you see that in mysticism. Um, you see it in conspiracy theories. You know, I, I, I feel bad that I, I, I do want to reiterate that I don't think conspiracy thinking and mystical thinking are necessarily I mean, the same thing. No, but, but it's because it, it, there's it, a lot of overlap, it, isn't there? So. Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's easy to make an analogy for that. But you already see that kind of gatekeeping, uh, in, you know, people who, you know, you're not a real flat earther because real flat earthers believe this. And um, yeah, so, you know, the, to get true mystical experiences, you must engage in this type of meditation, not that. I, I, it, yeah, it's a thing humans do, and I don't see any reason why we wouldn't do it in that area as well. Uh, Deborah, you were second on the nodding thing. So on the nodding thing, yeah. I mean, this is, this is really the difference between um, religion and superstition, is whether or not you've got a corporate entity taking control of the administration of services and the dictation of what the worldview is and um so you know if you go to um a regular mosque with a regular imam or a regular church with a regular anglican priest you will get a certain kind of a ritual to, to get married for example you know it, it's a it's a service and they would have gone through a specific it doesn't matter how personally um you know infused with god or you know, infused with anything they are, they, they get their qualifications and they're qualified to do it. And it's a very, very corporate model of it. Um, with, mis with mysticism, and this is why hippies can be really, really brutal. Um, and if you, you know, if you spend a time in a group of hippies, it can be a very brutal experience, is because the only thing that will qualify you to be the biggest person in the room is how, is how strong you are. Uh, and you see this so often when you've got new religious movements, not cults, not people who are trying to keep everybody else out, but just a new religious movement that they've, they've got some insight, they're going to start something off. Some of them succeed because they have the managerial skills to carry it on over a series of generations and to, and to become more corporate. The Mormons are an example of that. Um, but an awful lot of them die after one generation because you've got this original person who, who is charismatic and firm enough to be able to hold it together for that long. And then after that, there isn't anything else. So, uh, you know, the, these, these, aren't, these organizations aren't in, as different as they would seem. They're, they're just different in their kind of corporate organization and whether or not they've survived. Richie, is that anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think uh, with with these different movements and groups, and uh, to um, and to some extent all movements and groups, they slightly follow the um, 
Tuckman development model, you know, where it's um, forming, storming, norming, performing and adjoining. Have you come across that where, you know, the life cycle of groups where um, initially when people first come together, they have little clear purpose and direction. They may not have an overall um, vision. Different people are throwing in different ideas. Then they um, start to, you know, they go through various struggles and come up with a, a clearer sense of direction and th then once they've got that direction they pursue it for a bit um, and that works well for a time and then and then either because they've achieved their goals or because they fizzle out perhaps in the way um, Deborah just talked about they they then um, dissipate and sometimes of course with 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 movements that dissipation means uh, fracturing uh, splintering into different uh, sub movements um, I think um, new agey stuff has been um, or mystical spiritual stuff has been uh, less coherent um, in that way um, than say religious movements because the claims being made perhaps are often less ground they don't often try to answer life's ultimate questions and so the uh, hold that they get over people perhaps is weaker because um, uh, you know following on from that the threat that they can uh, make to people on, uh, if they leave their group um, are weaker um, so uh, that you know, then they're, they're not been as good as as, as religious movements uh, over time. But I think they still go through the same cycles, just in a slightly, you know, different way. So um, there's basically we've not got very much time left, um, and there's lots and lots of uh, different questions. Um, but I'm going to go to um, I'm going to sort of go to uh, one um, which is about. Oops, Way on the chat, which is basically about so what, what Duncan had asked was is contemporary interest in mysticism at all similar to the 60s alternative lifestyle movement? He then asked a question about IT, which you know I think has been answered earlier in terms of the social media question. But do you think there are, I mean, I don't, it, the, I asked that not knowing a huge amount about whether the, the sort of stereotype of the 60s hippie was actually true, and I put it in the context that. The 60s were actually far more socially you know socially conservative than you know the world is today um you know there's a time where homosexuality had only just become legal so i put that into all that context but do you think it do you think mysticism is generally part of a wider alternative lifestyle or is it actually just part of you know a, a thing that people believe what's going about their day normally um deborah i'll come to you first um, to be uh, alternative, I suppose it would have to go against the grain somewhat. The, you know, the, the hippies of Hate Ashbury were different to the, as you rightly point out, majority of uh, rather more conservative people who lived at the time. Uh, so to be alternative these days, um, I, I suspect that going your own way, using crystal healing, going to a Reiki practitioner, all of these things, I, su I suspect it's too mainstream to be, to be really reactive to anything. Andrew, do you have any reflections on that? Uh, yeah, I, th I mean, my initial, my initial thought was um, that, yes, it's, it's, it's people trying to be individual and stuff like that. But I think Deborah actually completely changed my mind with that comment that it is actually becoming so mainstream now. You know, um, worryingly, the, my local doctor has an advert for Reiki on their appointment cards, which I don't get me started. Um, so yeah, I think that a lot of it is quite mainstream, but there is still this um, aspect of rejecting the way religion's done in the past and doing it a different way, doing it in an individual way, um, which I think you know definitely comes into play. Uh, Richie, anything you want to add? Well, I don't know about the hippies of the 60s, and I think Deborah's right that they were very much more in a minority and a much more socially conservative climate. Um, but it is interesting, actually, that um, in the history of Humanist UK, the two, uh, well, the two most recent periods of strength uh, were the 60s and, and now. Um, so um, Humanist UK actually went into decline over the 70s through the 90s, um, only to then revive in the 2000s and now. And thankfully, we're a larger organisation than we've ever been before. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, when I've talked to people who are around in the 60s about why that happened to Humanist UK, um, what's often said is that uh, perhaps it was partly because lots of the goals of the time were achieved. Um, so things like the decriminalisation of homosexuality, um, uh, legal available abortions, divorce reform, um, uh, and various 
other things besides, um, you know, the voting age was lowered around then as well. So um, uh, the, lots of the goals were achieved and that, that caused um, the movement um, then perhaps to, to slightly dissipate because of the fact that um, it didn't form new goals immediately. Um, and, um, and I hope that we've now reached a sufficient critical mass that we don't at some stage uh, dissipate again in the future, although I'm sure we will. But um, I, I think it is interesting, actually, that, that comparison. Excellent. So we've got about seven minutes left, so I'm going to bring three uh, things to a close. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is um, thank you very much to, uh, to Richie Thompson, to Andrew Dar, and to Deborah Hyde uh, for giving up their evening to spend some time with us. Uh, it is absolutely uh, much appreciated. Uh, I don't know if people can do clapping emojis and things like that, but I think if you can, um, if you're, if you've got the camera on, then that's great. If not, uh, there are reactions at the bottom. Um, I've got my non-video participants off, so I can't tell if that's happening, but hopefully it is. Uh, but it is much appreciated. I think, you know, I think um, uh, it's been a really fascinating and interesting um, discussion.